between exposure and effects. Anybody who's dealt with toxicology and peripherally probably understand you need exposure to get effects and there's different intervals. Ecotoxicology is, of course, focused on non human. Uh, there's a whole lot of toxicology that's done on humans. Uh, ecotoxicology is sort of the hybrid between ecology and toxicology. So exposure is very fundamental to toxicology. Uh, just looking at water column concentrations and how that translates to an exposure, and this is pretty basic stuff, but, but fundamental and, and important to cover. You start with the concentration of a chemical or chemicals. In the case of oil, we've heard aggregated from hundreds to, what did Jim say, maybe a million or you know, some crazy high number of chemicals in crude oil. It would be in the water, but not necessarily and an exposed dose to any given organism, in this case a fish. <clears throat> we can imagine that the external concentration, they're, they're going to be passing this water over their gills. They're going to be taking it in uh, as they eat and feed in the water column, so they have an ingested dose. So that internal concentration that actually gets inside the organism, that's the, that's the, the quote unquote dose that we're going to be talking about. But typically, whenever you're dealing with aquatic toxicology, which is mainly what we're going to be you're going to see most concentration water concentration. That doesn't necessarily translate to the actual dose of the organism, but it's typically what, what's grabbed and shown. Then, of course, once it's inside the organism, it, it can reach its target tissues. Sometimes it's one specific target tissue. Often it's, it's several or many. And then it can elicit it, its effects. The other thing that obviously happens once it gets inside is there are um, detoxification and excretion mechanisms. Most organisms have. We'll talk about that a little bit a little more detail once we get to some later slides. And Jordan and even Jim talked about some of the uh, acute toxicity versus chronic toxicity uh, and as it relates to weathering. As well weather, you start losing your light ends. Light ends are more acutely toxic. Acute exposures are those that happen in a very short period of time. Very strict definition, one exposure is considered acute, acute exposure. Chronic exposures, of course, happen over either multiple exposures or some significant portion of their lifespan. And we'll talk about both a little bit here today. So here's some basic, you guys, there's jargon and everything. Toxicology has its own acronyms. And we'll sort of look at what some of the common terminology means. LC50. These are concentrations of 50%. We know that there is variability in sensitivity among organisms. So typically, toxicologists and more people talk about toxicologists will expose groups of organisms to contaminants. And we'll look at uh, sort of the statistical response to that. So you're going to have some very sensitive organisms respond to lower doses, more tolerant organisms within that population would take higher. But we're, we're talking about uh, the lethal concentration for 50% of the affected organism. Mortality is on the y-axis. Concentration in milligrams per liter in the water on the x-axis. So the way this works is uh, the point at which 50% of your test organisms are, are killed, you just come across to your, to your curve, drop down to your, your dose. In this case, it's just under 100 milligrams per liter, or whatever the, the chemical being characterized here is. And another important thing to remember is as the LC50 decreases, the toxicity is actually increasing, right? And that makes sense. If you think about it, it's less of something to elicit an effect. That means it's, it's more, uh, more toxic. Here's another way of displaying effects. In this case, we have uh, a reproductive endpoint, the number of eggs per female fish on the y-axis. And you can see uh, the number of eggs is just simply a count. In this case, it's you know pretty close to 250, up to a point here, right? And on the y, or excuse me, the x-axis, you have concentration of your chemical or chemicals in, in water, again in milligrams per liter. So if you're going to see these terms. Sometimes you'll see the A drop out of the NOEC or LOEC. So you have the NOEC and LOEC. It stands for No Observable Adverse Effect Concentration. So things are going along fine here. Uh, very low exposure concentration here. Uh, number of eggs is not affected until this point, right? This is the last point at which there is no effect. That's what the NOAC stands for. 
first dose beyond that, concentration rather, beyond that is your low exposure, lowest observed adverse effect concentration on the low end. So those are those terms. So we're going to talk about both direct and indirect effects. Uh, direct effects are things, you know, an individual organism is exposed and it has an effect. That's a direct effect. Indirect effects will cover a little bit later. Um, when you get into the ecology of a situation, once you have a perturbation or a disruption of your ecosystem, um, strange or unpredictable things can begin to happen, and those are more of the indirect effects. Who knows what rock this is? I <laughs> briefly yesterday. Adam's <laughs> rock, yeah, Miriam's rock, right? Exactly. So, indirect effects, uh, that's sort of the classic example of indirect effects. We all know, you know, a couple of decades or more now of, of photographing and monitoring this thing. But apparently it wasn't cleaned after some of these. Uh, they monitored the, the organisms on it, the fucus and uh, green algae and the encrusted organisms. And it took about three to four years for the community to, to stabilize. Of course, it's a moving baseline, so it's a little bit complex. But there was a change in the habitat, a change in the prey and predator abundance. My understanding is there was an initial decrease in fucus or rockweed, and that had an effect on the grazer population. So the periwinkles, the limpets, I believe it was, went down, and that allowed uh, an initial bloom of green algae. So all of a sudden, you have a decrease in rockweed, uh, a little pause, and then a bloom in green algae. So those are some of the indirect effects. So disruption. So we have various methods to evaluate the uh, petroleum toxicity. There's three basic um, paradigms of how to approach this. TPH, or total petroleum hydrocarbon, is a mixture, right? It's not just alkanes, and not just alkenes, not just aromatics, but it's a mixture of all those. There's TPH gas, TPH diesel, TPH motor oil, maybe even more. But uh, those are mixtures. But it's, a, it's one way that we characterize oil, and one way to approach characterizing the toxicity. So if you wanted to link any set of particular toxic types to a benchmark, you can do it with TPH. And there is some toxicology literature that's in, in TPH units. Another way to do it or approach it is through indicator com compounds. Uh, and several of the speakers have touched on this, BTAX, benzene, polyethylene, benzene, and xylene. All the uh, alkylated mono aromatics uh, are quite acutely toxic. So that is one way we benchmark um, exposures to something we know is toxic, characterize the PTEX. Of course, they're also very volatile, so very ephemeral, fleeting. Uh, you have to get samples pretty quickly to capture PTEX, as we learned in the weather. Um, pretty much within a day, right? Most PTEX is going to be gone unless there's some unusual set of circumstances or some sort of film that's going to trap uh, volatiles. Benzoepyrene is a PAH, so that's another one that's uh, sometimes used. Uh, a lot of the other PAHs are benchmarks to the toxicity of benzoepyrene. So anyway, indicator compounds is a second approach to characterizing toxicity. And then there's individual fractions, things like aliphatics, pentane, your hexane, straight chain, aromatics, you can look at those, your monoaromatics mono like benzene, polycyclic aromatic or high aromatic aromatic PAHs, and even polar compounds like ibenzoclavin. So this isn't strictly speaking uh, a PAH because it's got sulfur there. Oxygen also makes um, hydrocarbons more polar, so things with sulfur or oxygen on them are what we're going to refer to generally as our polars. 
gasoline would act like a solvent. And um, I think Jim McCall talked about the phospholipid bilayer, which forms a membrane of all cells. That membrane can be stripped away, essentially, by a solvent, and which gasoline is. So my, my suspicion is very thin membranes and sensitive membranes in the gills can actually be solvated by gasoline, thus causing bleeding. Physical solvation and membrane penetration um, it's also the basis of the uh, nonpolar narcosis model. Uh, organisms across the board respond in a very sort of set way to nonpolar narcosis, which involves a disruption of the, the membrane uh, neurons and leads to a general narcosis. It's also the basis for, for uh, anesthesia. So it can actually have effects from fouling and smothering itself. This is not mere rock. This is a rock uh, at Rodeo Beach, just outside the San Francisco Bay. It's on the outer coast. Uh, this was um, an oil region uh, from the Costa Busan spill. This area back in the back was unoiled. And this area we're going to look at a little more detail, closer up photograph, right here was oil. So this is what it looked like um, 23 November 2007. Here's a closer picture of that same uh, region up here, showing that it's, it's covered in uh, <coughs> black oil. By January of 2008, you, had, you saw this actual bleaching, this actual uh, yellowing of, of white formation. Of the, uh, algae. So this is an example of direct fouling or smothering uh, from, from that oil. Now, chronic effects on plant growth, because this is a, a classic graph taken out of a textbook that was written some years ago. But of course, it's longer term exposure to oiling. This is actually characterizing oil in the sediment. I think this was from the UK. So they actually looked at grams per kilogram of wet weight of sediment so that the oil is in grams per, per unit of, uh, per kilogram of sediment. And on the y-axis, it's happening plant height. So the, the metric used for health of the plants here is just a simple plant height, and you can see that as you uh, increase the, the concentration of oil and sediment, what's happening to the plant height decreases. So these plants are rooted into this, there's a chronic long-term exposure to it, and resulting in a decrease in plant height. So it's just an example of chronic effects to plants. It can also be chronic effects on invertebrates, and animal, animal behavior is one of those endpoints. Uh, we talked about nonpolar narcosis. Nonpolar narcosis generally results in a reduction or in response to stimuli. And um, I believe it was three decades or so after the Buzzards Bay uh, spill in Massachusetts, uh, they did some studies to show that crabs, I think it was fiddler crabs, actually had delayed uh, response rates um, 35 ish years after the spill. Actually, growing less frequently into the sediment that was contaminated with oil still. They have lower feeding rates and slower response rates to stimulus. So, their escape responses, for instance, were delayed. Uh, so, they're probably uh, suffering from, from uh, non polar narcosis and reduction uh, in the speed with which they can react to stimulus. Some of the chronic effects of constituents, PAH, of course, we heard. Um, earlier that uh, some early life stages of fishes are actually quite uh, quite sensitive to specific pH, especially th the thought is three and four ring pH are really the most potent of them, but I think there's a lot of research still going on on that. John M. Cardona is really one of the lead scientists heading that up. Cancer in fish is also another endpoint. We, we, we see cancer forming in fish after exposure to pH, and we'll talk more about that. And there's also other sublethal effects as well. Polars come up a couple times already, and those are those are certainly uh, we're learning more and more about that. It's sort of one of the more new aspects of petroleum toxicology that's emerging. We're learning more and more about the role they play. So this is kind of an interesting pH early life stage uh, exposure graph. And this was done some time ago following uh, Carl's et al. And this was exposure to uh, juvenile herring. And what you see 
squares in the in less weathered oil and more weathered oil is in the circles. And in the spirit of quiz questions, I didn't build any quiz questions in. Why would you think that the concentration of more weathered oil stops here, whereas the less weathered oil goes up higher? Because on the x-axis is your total pH concentration in the water. What, what's a potential explanation for that? Solubility. So as the oil weathers, does it get more or less? Less. So the more soluble fractions are dissipated, evaporated, all these things that Jordan touched about. That's my guess about why we don't get that much. But in any case, both the more and less weathered oil, the circles are the uh, more weathered, the squares are the less weathered oil. You see a pretty strong increase in the dead or more abundant larvae uh, as the total pH concentration increases in water. This is a logarithmic scale. So you see a real, real rapid rise between 10 and 100 Here's some photographs of, uh, this is actually done in zebra fish. There's also been work done in herring. And actually on NPR a couple of days ago on my commute home, I actually heard uh, John A. Cardona talking, being interviewed about uh, these same effects on some species of tuna in the Gulf. So it seems to be a conserved mechanism toxic toxicology across many different species. <clears throat> in any case, this is a photograph of uh, Control group. This is the carrier EMSO exposed only. This is what these uh, zebrafish are supposed to look like in their embryonic form. And this is with exposure to phenanthrene, which is a three ring pH, uh, 56 micromolar. We see uh, edema, pretty, pretty severe edema, both uh, pericardial and yolk sac edema. Uh, you see spinal malformations. Craniofacial malformations are quite common as well. The, the current theory is this all stems from initial injury to the heart in early, early life stages of development. It results in deformities that sort of cascade out from that. But, uh, pretty notable deformations. Here's some uh, herring embryos that were actually from, uh, from the Costco Busan spill. And you can see on the left here, these, these are in the spill zone from the Costco Busan oil. And on the right is um, a picture of, of one outside of the spill zone. And note that 90% of the eggs and larvae were lost in the spill zone. And almost no eggs or larvae were lost just outside. So our control site didn't get oil. This is what things look like at pretty, pretty high survival. And with 90% loss from the spill zone. That was bunker fuel, very high in, in the larger Molecules, larger molecular weight PAHs, pretty toxic stuff. Early on stage. What about reproductive toxicity? Um, this this data is actually from a NOAA field study, which is pretty impressive to me that they're able to get this kind of data out of a field study. We're talking about English sole here. They're known to be fairly sensitive to PAHs. They, they did studies of urbanized and non-urbanized conveyance. Um, English sole are a benthic fish, so they, they're in contact with the bottom, they feed off the bottom, and they have relatively small home ranges, so they're not wandering all over the place. You can kind of, there's a, enough site fidelity there, you can actually make associations to characteristics of a particular invader, and not worry about them migrating out to sea and pack, where they get their exposure. But what we're seeing is at about 630 parts per billion, uh, total pH is in the sediment. Um, you notice the x axis is sediment concentration. The y-axis is your proportion affected, so this would 50% would be right about here. But at 630 parts per million, you're seeing infertility in your eggs, as well as uh, pretty pretty strong uh, inhibited spawning taking off at, at concentrations exceeding 630 parts per billion. Pretty impressive stuff. So this particular picture is um, from the Great Lakes. I believe that's a, a bullhead. Um, you can see pretty pronounced tumors on the liver. The PAHs are certainly known to cause liver lesions uh, in other species as well, including the 
so other than lethality, there's also immunotoxicity, so suppressed immune systems has been noted following exposure to pH in fishes. And enzyme induction. Um, Cytochrome P450 is sort of your classic detoxification enzyme. That whole family, it's a suite of enzymes really, uh, is induced in the liver. So this is a picture of a healthy liver, fish liver, uh, following exposure to pHs. And what is the job of Cytochrome P450? What's its role? What's it supposed to do for an organism? Any guesses? More polar. It's supposed to make it more polar so they can be excreted. And, you know, so it's a detoxification mechanism. It's a bit of a double edged sword, though, because as we can see here, benzoepyrene gets metabolized to, uh, to this form and then ultimately to this more non toxic form, which is a good thing, right? That can be, that's more polar than being excreted by the fish. But it can actually go further and be metabolized to a, a quite toxic form. This is an epoxide formation. Whenever you've seen an epoxide form on a, on a molecule, it's very reactive and unstable and often very, very toxic. So, so it's a bit of a double edged sword. It can actually detoxify, it can actually form very toxic metabolites as well. If you read, well, you probably not read the tox literature, but sometimes you'll see it characterized as CYP1A as one specific isozyme of so and that's why I refer to it as a, a sweet event. So if, if you see elevated cytochrome P450 in and of, it, of itself is not necessarily harmful, it's, it's the reaction uh, that's supposed to follow from exposure to pHs, but um, it's considered a biomarker of exposure. So I promised we would talk a little more about metabolism and half-life of pHs in organisms. So, the very old paradigm was, oh, invertebrates don't metabolize pH, but fish do. And pHs can't, can't bioaccumulate fish because they metabolize them. Well, we know that metabolism is quite variable. And this is a really interesting graph because it shows um, here benzoepyrene metabolized, and these are following seven day exposure to benzoepyrene to multiple species here. These are all polychaetes, all grouped together. You can see there's a huge amount of variability. Um, bivalves here, which we, you know, of course we like to collect bivalves as really good indicator tissues uh, following this bill to show us how much uh, pH is accumulated in the environment. And then amphipods over here. You can see the amphipods don't metabolize a whole lot, uh, probably less than 10%, maybe 10% in this particular case. But notice here, the polychaetes, you have one species of polychaete in seven days metabolizes quite a bit less than 10%. While another species here is up around 90% metabolism. So in fact, we know that invertebrates now, we, now we know better, invertebrates can metabolize pHs. Uh, so they're not, uh, they're not just you know, accumulators that can't metabolize and break down pH like we had at one point thought. So elimination rates are, are half-life, the period of time which it takes to eliminate half of, of pH level half-life. Uh, for trout, it's in, in a range of six to nine days. Uh, and for invertebrates, it's even more variable, as you can see, so sort of illustrated in this graph above, less than half a day to 30 days. It depends on the invertebrate, right? Some of them are really capable of metabolizing pH and some of them are not at all. Very capable. So pHs and bivalves, as I mentioned um, earlier, one of the targets you should go out and collect the following morsels, and sometimes even the characterized baseline of the floor morsel is um, bivalves, you know, clams, mussels, things like that. They tend to clam up when there's an exposure. Their strategy is, hey, water quality is bad. I'm going to close up right now, try and, try and wait it out, and open up once things are better again. Uh, but they can only do that for so long, so we find eventually they end up being quite good uh, tissue uh, to collect for, for characterizing. We also know that they can experience reduced growth following exposures. So uh, sometimes you'll hear that characterized as a reduced scope for growth. And lysosomal destabilization. Here's another biomarker in the same ballpark as like the cytochrome 
actual um, results from, I think this was Cosmo who saw it, but it might have been, been too I start. In any case, San Leandro Marina and Harbor Bay Farm Island actually probably was Dubai Star. Um, so we saw something less than 40% of the lysosome membranes had uh, intact, uh, had been disrupted, I should say. And, but at a higher exposure point, which was groin wall, Nelson Grohl groin wall, uh, you see above 60% lysosomal uh, disruption or destabilization. Spirit of quizzes, reaching back to your probably your high school, maybe freshman biology class. What's a lysosome? Extra credit for everybody knows. So what, what's, what's the function of a lysosome? Anybody? <laughs> yes, digesting things. So its role is to digest things. It's an organelle inside the cell whose job is to digest things. It has a membrane, and inside the membrane are digestive enzymes. So it's not a good thing to disrupt that membrane and have those digestive enzymes. Cell and pH exposure can be linked to the disruption of that membrane. Of course, mortality. When you, what is a what is a dead muscle on a pure pilot do? Following a multiple, it just gapes and kind of falls open. So that's that's pretty obvious visual indication of toxicity. So let's move on and talk a little bit about effects on aquatic birds and mammals. So I won't talk at any great length about the effects of actual oil contact on birds. You'll, you'll hear quite a bit about that, I think, Thursday from Holly Gellerman and Kira from Olympia. But needless to say, it's bad. We don't, we don't like to see oil damage. It's not good for them. So there's direct oiling effects on the bird, and it allows uh, cold water to get, get against their skin and cause that other problems. There's also indirect oiling of the eggs, and we know that even one microliter transferred to, a, to an egg can cause embryo lethality and cause remarkably similar effects to what we saw in the embryonic fish, cardiac defects, edema, uh, and ultimate mortality and the inhibition of gas exchange uh, to, the, to the developing chick inside the egg. Yes? How much did you say? Uh, as little as one microliter has been demonstrated to be lethal to, to, a, to, to a bird. And you can imagine oiling situation with, with oil on the plumage, it would be pretty easy during an essay season to transfer that to the eggs. Certainly, we could at least give one micro there. Okay. So chronic effects or longer term effects of uh, pH and TPH. We have seen that eggshell strength can be affected. So whenever you see a dose that's expressed in milligram per kilogram per day, whether it be TPH or anything else. That's a, an ingested dose or feeding dose. It could be delivered by drinking water, but it's, it's an ingested dose. And that, that stands for milligrams of the chemical you're talking about per kilogram of body weight of the organism per day. So that's basically a feeding rate. But at, at these, these uh, doses, 250 to 3,000 mix per, per day, you're going to see uh, decreased eggshell strength patchability, fertility, and egg production. Uh, decreases in body weight, of course, uh, from ingesting. So when a bird gets oiled, what's one of the first things you're going to see it do? Probably two things. It's going to haul out and try and get warm. But then it's going to start doing what? Preying. So it's, while it's preying, it's, getting, it's ingesting a dose. And Kira will probably talk some more about some of the, uh, the observed symptoms and, and, and uh, gastrointestinal disruptions that happen inside birds that are creating and trying to move that oil. So reduced body weight, we also see lesions in the liver. Uh, cytochrome P450 induction, which we also see in fish. It's a pretty common evolutionary mechanism for detoxification, uh, as well as kidney degeneration as well. Uh, immune function, that's another one we saw in fish as well, right? So we can see de decreased resistance to disease, so a disruption of their immune system following exposure to pHs. Which is a bad thing when you're trying to just, uh, rehab a bird. 
guidelines on TPH in soil, and they run a pretty wide range between 100 milligrams per kilogram of soil to about 10,000 milligrams. Uh, so we won't get into all the details of that, but just know that the guidelines are pretty sparse and quite variable. As we've seen before, the lighter mixtures are more acutely toxic anyway than the heavier crude oils. Chronic exposure might be a different story, right? But um, also, as of weather, the heavier things are going to be less and less bioavailable in the soils too. Literature studies have to match the characteristics of the spill. So Jim talked about that a lot, that crude oil, even from the same formation, sometimes from the bottom and the top, can, can vary in their chemical composition. And certainly crude oils from different locations can vary by minimum toxicity. So you really got to be careful when you're matching toxicity studies to any specific event. You wouldn't, for instance, want to compare fresh crude toxicities to something very heavily weathered, or San Joaquin crude to Saudi Arabia might be a very, very different story um, following exposure. What? The, the lighter ones are more toxic because they're more acute toxic, and the heavier ones are more chronic toxic. Does that make it less toxic because they're not in the um, ecosystem long enough for the chronic effects to be significant? For the lighter end stuff? For the heavier stuff for the heavier that stuff. is more chronic. Well, it's probably what? both. It's probably an exposure situation because you know, anybody who's seen more weathered oil, even in soil or on the soil, it can form a crust and become very hard and a lot less soluble than any kind of cold water that might eventually you know, wash over it. So I think it's probably both, that would be my guess. It's both an exposure and an inherent uh, reduction in toxicity, at least acute toxicity. So this is kind of an interesting, uh, hopefully you can see it well enough, it's a pretty small room. Um, effects on germination and growth, and this is pretty intuitive. Anybody who's grown a garden understands that you know, soil, soil conditions are pretty important to good growth. But in this particular uh, case, you had 100% contaminated soil right here, and you see almost no germination. Whereas the control and the very lowest dose levels are very healthy and vigorous. So um, TPH, exposure in soil, you can see there's a nice gradation, it's 100%. 50%, 25%, uh, what's that one? 12, 12 and a half, uh, and six, six and a quarter percent. So you start seeing pretty healthy growth in these concentrations, whereas the full strength soil, uh, very poor germination. Through all 
again, the variability in the TPH measure, variability in the actual uh, mixture content uh, of, of crude oil. So soil invertebrates, uh, it can actually affect the survival and reproduction of them as well, things like earthworms. And there are some benchmarks out there. They were ranged quite a bit as well, 47 to over 1,000 milligrams of TPH per kilogram of crude oil. Generally speaking, the, the soil invertebrates are more sensitive. You can see here in this table. These are individual PAHs. Uh, and we have EC20 and EC10. So the EC20 is for plant growth. EC10 is for reverberate reproduction. More than likely, this was the one of the lowest observable adverse effect concentrations that they were able to identify. Uh, so it's a little bit apples and oranges comparing EC10 to EC20. But generally speaking, the invertebrates are more sensitive. And you can see in every case you have a lower concentration of the sitting in the EC, EC10. Oh, by the way, we haven't covered the EC effect concentration with EC. So that's anything sublethal. LC means basically anything else. And in this case, it's for uh, growth, uh, or re excuse me, for reproduction and plant growth are the endpoints. And in every case, like for instance, chloranthal, you see quite a bit lower number for, for effects on invertebrate reproduction and you know, plant growth. Kind of mentioned that benzene, telling you that benzene dying are volatile, they can affect growing of organisms. So once you get into the subsurface, you need to be cognizant of that. There are soil gases down there, and uh, there, it is a potential exposure pathway to organisms. Uh, any other than the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, anybody identify that little critter down there? Burrowing. Burrowing out. Very good. You're a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. <laughs> 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 I'm a fish biologist. I grew up where I lived. Very important to define the exposure and effects relationship in order to predict uh, effects. We talked about the 